Hall of Fame broadcaster Marty Brenneman here, and he's the best storyteller in the game, and it's time to sit back, relax, and have some laughs. Welcome to the mayor's office, and here's your host, Sean Casey. Boom, chicks, we're back at it. We're back at it, brother. What's going on, man? I, I don't know what to do with myself. We, we have we have <laughs> Hall of Famers on, you know, Johnny Bench, some of the greatest players ever. I, I don't know if there's somebody who has had more of an influence on me even getting into broadcasting into this stuff as the young lady we're having on today who is in my town, coming from New York, about as big an icon and one of the greatest people from all, what everybody said, I, I don't even know what to do. I got, I got to stop talking. You just take it. Just take uh, it. Uh, Explain right, who we got. This is going to be a good, this is going to, we've been waiting for this one. It's going to be a great one. First off, let's introduce for, she is in Cooperstown and there's, there's a women in baseball exhibit, which is awesome. And, and, and Susan is, is in that. She's the first time, first full-time female color commentator, in major league baseball history started in 2005 on the radio broadcast with John Sterling. One of the best in the business. I know we say like, Hey, the first woman, let's stop some of that stuff stuff and just say one of the best in the business. And everyone knows it. Yep. Um, she also, uh, we're going to talk about this. She also got to New York as on Broadway, which mm-hmm. is really cool. I love this stuff. Cause yeah. when you start looking into your friends, you're like, man, this is unbelievable stuff. So <laughs> let's bring her in without further further ado let's bring her in susan waldman susan thank you so much for joining us oh my goodness i don't know who you're talking about (laughs) (laughs) i'm I'm looking maybe you're talking about my dog (laughs) i gotta tell you though i gotta stop you right there because you brought up the women in baseball room do you know how that happened no 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 we don't this is the greatest story do you remember though they just had their 30th anniversary a league of their own Yes. Okay. What happened was after that movie, which ends with them going into the the Baseball Hall of Fame to that room, people went to the Hall of Fame and it wasn't there. Oh, (laughs) my goodness. So they built it. Wow. And that's that's absolutely true. And Jeff Idelson, who was the former president, yes. said, we're going to have this big thing. I, of course, was doing a game in Oakland or something uh, and couldn't right. go. But they actually built it because people came to see the room after the movie. That's amazing. Wow. That is so, now, now, what do you feel about that? Like you're, like you're in Cooperstown. Like, I mean, seriously, like the, 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 the little Susan Waldman who was at Fenway Park all the years, you're in an exhibit in Cooperstown. Like, how does that make you feel? Well, I, I got to tell you, when I finally got there for the first time and they took me on a tour of everything, I was just sobbing like a five-year-old. <laughs> and like I am now because I saw yeah. everything. Um, but this is, it was really something because back then it was just a few things because they had to have the room because people right. were coming. Um, but I walked in and the first thing you see is a, a, a montage and there's five pictures and it's the original uh, Rockford Peaches and um, one of the one of the pitchers, there was a pitcher back in the 40s who was actually really good and the real Dottie Hinson, I think, the real, yes. the real one. And there's me and Joe Torrey and I just, wow. just you know, I, it was, um, it was really something. And there's my... Um, Microphone from the first World Series. I was the first woman ever to do a World Series, 2009, on the radio. And there's my microphone and a couple of my pictures. One of them's in back of me. Um, They asked me for my favorite picture of, and I've got thousands of them, but there's one from 1996 when uh, the Yankees clinched in Baltimore to go to the World Series. And Mariano didn't drink so he didn't want to be near this champagne so if you remember sean you go into that um there's a shower room in in the the yours and there's a big towel rack and mariano was sitting by himself on the towel rack and i went in and i was interviewing him there (laughs) picture is me and mariano sitting in a towel rack at the bathroom and it came in the clubhouse it's my favorite picture ever, and everybody thinks I'm carrying a pocketbook, but it was the size of the the tape recorder back then. <laughs> back then yes, right. It was, um, yeah. But it's my favorite picture, and I, I texted Mo when when I got it when it went up, and I said, "You and I in the bathroom are going to." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but they have a new. Um, they're recently. I think I don't know if they started already, but they're coming out with a on Amazon Prime. I believe is coming out with a League of Their Own series. You know, yeah. 
I see yeah. that. I see that. That is my, I have that movie in every form that it's ever released. It started on beta, and then the other one, I've got four of them that I can't use anymore. And, I, and, and if I can find a CD player anymore, I can still play it. But that is, so and I know every line of that place. I, I love that. The song still makes me cry. Mm. You know, yeah. my my playground. I, it's just, yeah. it just gets me every single time. I can't wait for this series. Every oh, time, so every time towards the end when it's the, um, I have a brother who's six years older than me, and we both play baseball. And when it's at the end, and they're kind of saying goodbye, and her little sister's growing up, I cry like a baby every time I see that scene. I, I don't know what hits me, but it just—it's such a great movie. It brings you back. It brings you everybody in. It's amazing too. Su- Susan, for you, can can you can you bring us back a little bit? You know, we're talking about Cooperstown and like how amazing that is for you, and obviously the bi- the big baseball you fa- fan you are. But you grew out you grew up just outside of Boston, right? And and now you're you know you're the radio commentator doing the play by play for the New York Yankees for all these years. How did you start to love baseball? Like you know, what was it about your your, your upbringing that you love baseball so much? Well, I and mean, I know you played in Boston, and you must know that what, oh. what is important. Important in Boston. Uh, I had, <laughs> yes, I had what I thought was my own season ticket when I was four. So this is the fifties, and no one went. And I literally could reach out and touch Ted Williams from where I sat. And oh I, wow! I was a little cutie, Sean. I mean, I right. would, <laughs> and I would like peek into the dugout and wave, and you know, and I was adorable. I had my yeah. little Mary Jane's on, and we all wore dresses, and my grandfather's in his hat and his coat, and. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, it's amazing because I started really early to um, talk. I had one hero in my life, and I don't know why, but I knew him his whole life and my whole life, and that was Ted Williams. And Johnny Pesky, who was his best friend, uh, got traded yes. for really little, but then came back. I called Johnny Pesky Uncle Johnny till the day he died. And that's that's what is in Boston. You grow up with, with three things, um, education, sports, and politics, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and right. that's what and that's what I had. I went with my grandfather all the time from the 50s on and we had tickets to um harvard football games my grandfather was class of 1916 and so harvard wow. games and then celtics obviously and it but the difference is and everybody goes so what there was no one in the park i knew everyone in that park and i knew all the people around me um i knew everybody i knew the ushers i knew everybody and it was like a family and i was this one woman i think her name was miss dooley elizabeth dooley she used to bake cookies for ted williams i mean it was just come on different. no i'm not kidding i'm not kidding it was very very different you knew everyone in the park cardinal cushing used to bring the nuns i remember six, sister mary or sister catherine taught me how to score a book i was four or five and i remember her telling me don't go don't go outside the box. I never stayed inside the box in my whole life. <laughs> I knew what it for. Um, but it was just part of it. And you know, it's funny, Sean, because um, this was all what I am now is an accident. I, I was always going to go to New York to be on Broadway. I was going to be a star. And that's and I always was going to do it. And baseball was an avocation. I just loved it. I just loved every part of it. And um, I became friends with a lot of people. And one of them was the former, he's gone now, but Ken Coleman, the voice of the Boston Red Sox, who actually got me into this business when I realized that, you know, I was going to, I was getting to, you know, like a, like a ball player knows that it's time. Yeah. A performer does too. You know, when you make mm. a living with your body and when you sing and dance and act, you yeah. make a living with your body. And the music, I came to New York and I would always go to ball games, always. I would go to every Red Sox game at Yankee Stadium. I used to sing the anthem at, at Shea all the time. Wow. And it was a way to stay close to the game that I loved. And I, I never knew that I wasn't supposed to know about baseball. I mean, my mother knew. My aunts knew. I mean, as I talked about the nuns, Cardinal Cushing brought the nuns. They knew how to score. They knew everything. I didn't know women were supposed to be kids. I had no idea. Um, so what happens is that, like a player, you kind of age out. And I could still do it, but when I stood next to someone 25, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it wasn't the same. So they were – and it's, it's the same thing. And I was trying to think um, – what do I do next? I mean, I've got to do something. I knew the music was changing. I knew the Broadway I came to New York to do um, was gone. It's not coming back. And like, like how, how was it different? Um, 
the music is different. It used to be um, a musical would star somebody. And how you got to be that person was that, you know, you went to summer stock and you did this and then you're in the chorus and then you did things and you became a star. I was going to be, and I'll new names that nobody will know, Ethel Merman, Mary Martin, Barbara Cook. I was going to be all of them wrapped into one. However, there already were those people. So it was really kind of tough. <laughs> what happened is that as things changed, um, producers realized that the show has to be the star and not the people because it was too expensive. So when I started losing parts to like television stars who never sang, and, <laughs> you know, this is this is it. And it was one person, it was Andrew Lloyd Webber who wrote Avita and wrote all these things that absolutely changed it. And, and there was a moment actually when I knew that I had to get out of this business. Um, I was doing Man of La Mancha in Toronto, and it was before Avita opened. What Patti Lapone had already been cast as Avita in New York, and Andrew Lloyd Webber had the idea that he was going to open the show at the same time in Los Angeles, have two shows going. It never happened, but it was going to. So they had five women. This is 1979. I would have made a great Avita. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> just subtract all these years, I would have been. <laughs> Anyway, I came down, I was doing La Mancha in Toronto and I came down and there were five women and I started to sing and I had my, you know, I learned it all. And I heard from the back, Susan, can you get that tone out of your voice? And I said, what do you mean? That Broadway stuff, get it out. <laughs> and I said, why would I do that? And what I heard from the back of the um, auditorium was the star of the show is the music, not the girl. Wow. And I went through my head and in two seconds, I said, oh, my God. All right. Thank you very much. Gave the script back. And I said, I got to find something else to do with my life. And at, at that moment, um, 1979, things started. I still worked. I still was in theater. I did a couple more shows after that until WFAN went on the air. But, you know, the, and what was the only other thing that I knew how to do? I knew sports. Oh, this would be a cool idea. And I. It, but all kinds of things happened. How I used to spend my time on the road was go to ball games. How I would go to ball games was to sing the national anthem because it was the 70s. Nobody realized it was a way to get on television yet. I just wanted to go to the ball games <laughs> and nobody was ever doing it. And so I started and um, met people, talked to people. And um, one guy, changed my life. I've never seen him before or since. His name was Wes Parker. Remember Wes Parker? Yeah. First basement. He was doing yes. a thing in Minnesota with Joe Garagiola. And I was yes. sitting on the bench and I was talking to Jim Rice. I'm still an actress, remember? I'm still- Oh, I was gonna say, oh, you're still an actress, wow. Oh yeah, I'm starring in Man of La Mancha and we're in Minneapolis. And so I'm going to the game and I'm singing and I'm sitting there and I'm talking to Jim Rice and, um, Wes Parker is standing in back of me because evidently he wants to talk to me about acting because he, after that, was like on the Brady Bunch and he had seen me do La Mancha. And I'm talking to Jim Rice and I turn around and he introduces himself to me and he says something that changed my life. He said, have you ever thought of doing this for a living? And I said, doing what for a living? <laughs> And he said, well, you just got Jim Rice to tell you that no one has thrown him a fastball since the beginning of April. And, and you said to him, um, I actually said to Jim Rice, and I remember this, I remember saying, so you're hitting 315 by accident, is what you're telling me. And he laughed. And Wes Parker had said, and then he started talking about acting. And um, yeah, and I never saw him again. And, I, wow. <laughs> and I'd love to thank him someday. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Wow. So wait, that, Susan, when, when WFAN, back then, can you take us back? It's, it's almost like when cable started. Like, so, you know what I'm saying? No, 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 no. Wait, wait. I didn't mean it that way. And Marconi had just... <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> wait, I, I misspoke. I meant like when cable no, TV... <laughs> No, when cable TV started, people were like, I'm not paying. I'm not going to watch whatever. And then it was like ESPN. It's like, what's all sports? All sports radio was something that was just that nobody had ever really heard about it or anything. And what, what made you say, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot because what did you see in it? <laughs> what did I see in it? Yeah. Um, I saw a job for one thing. Uh, <laughs> here's what happened. Um, in 1980, it went on in 1987. And my friend Ken Coleman um, was friends with the guy 
named John Shannon. He's also gone now, but he had started something. They had tried this before called Enterprise Radio out of Connecticut. And um, but Ken Coleman called me up and he said, Suicide, I, you know, I met this friend of mine. They're starting this thing next year, FAN, W-F-A-N or something. I told him um, he has to meet you. And I said, OK. And they I had thought it would work only because um, <laughs> When I started doing La Mancha, Richard Kiley, who was the star, didn't like to get up in the morning. So I was always doing Good Morning Miami and Good Morning Toronto and Good Morning Pittsburgh. <laughs> and after we talked about the show for a minute and a half, they always said, get the girl that can talk about sports. And whenever I was in a city, I would just immerse myself in what was going on because you'd go to the ball game. And for me, uh, you're on the road and you're alone. And for me, I would find a family for an afternoon. I mean, their fans are all alike, different accents. Mm -hmm. But I'd go sit in Pittsburgh and they're the same people as sat in Fenway <laughs> Park. And, said, and if you're ready for their team, I mean, they're, they tell you all about themselves and you find friends for an afternoon. So this is what I did. And they all and I loved all sports and knew every sport. And I, so I said, OK, so I called this guy, John Shannon, and he said, um, you need a I think it would be great if you did like a sports report, because obviously I love to talk. Just tell me to shut up. <laughs> no, we love it. <laughs> and he said, make a tape. And I said, sure. <laughs> I didn't know what he was talking about. So I went into a studio with a guy that I had met and he was um, doing um, overnights at WCBS FM, and we did a mock sports record uh, report. And the idea was to have me do updates with a guy named mm -hmm. Pete Franklin, who was an acerbic voiced guy from Cleveland who was coming in to do FAN. And I put in a phony sports report and made it and was sarcastic and all that. Put the cassette on his desk on you know eight o'clock Monday morning, and they said, "Oh yeah, okay, this will be good." Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I knew I could talk about sports. I knew I was a performer, but radio, uh, to get back to your question, which was about 20 minutes ago, <laughs> uh, I thought that there was a place for it because in Boston, everybody waited for the six o'clock Eddie Andelman show on, on Sundays. Everybody waited for so-and-so. And I got to New York and there was Art Rust and there was Bill Mazur. And I just thought it would. there's so much to talk about but I knew what they were doing was wrong because they had national people and sports mm. is very insular and it's very chauvinistic and nobody wants to hear about Nebraska football in <laughs> New York. I mean, it's, just, it's just, you know, they want to hear and they know if you know their team really fast, really fast. And so I just didn't think, I figured if, if they could just get it to more local, which they did. And I was the one actually that went to, after they tried to fire me a million times, <laughs> I actually went to the then program director and said, you know, this doesn't work having uh, people from the Daily News and uh, the New York Times talking about the Yankees and the Mets. They're not going to tell you anything. Give me a tape recorder and I'll go and stand there with a microphone. And that's how the beat report, that's how the electronic beat reporter started because I didn't, um, I wanted to get off overnights because they tried. They couldn't fire me, so they moved me to overnights, thinking I was <laughs> going to quit. It was just a, it was just an ugly time. Um, but that also, you know what, guys? I had never faced hatred and the stuff that I went through because I was female. I'm a middle-aged woman, and all of a sudden, yeah. whoa! I don't. What do you mean? I don't know. I mean, we're not transplanting a kidney here. It's baseball. <laughs> we're talking it's baseball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we're just, not curing cancer. We're we're talking okay. about uh we're right. talking about Aaron Judge's swing. It's not a big deal. Uh, but it's but so I said, let me do that, and that's how that that's how that started. Um, but it was like a turbulent time. I was just trying to find something to do so that I wouldn't have to you know <laughs> go to work. <laughs> 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 Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first broadcast of WFAN All Sports 1050. Susan, for you, like when you you know you talk about you know maybe some people weren't so accepting and that there were some tough times and like how did you push on through that? Like uh, how did you have the you know the, the 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 strength and the grit to say you know what it doesn't matter what anybody says I'm doing this because I love it and it's my passion no matter what. Well, I, you know, it's easy to just give a, a glib answer is I don't like people telling me no. But yeah. there, but I think also um, I don't like people telling me no. <laughs> I didn't 
really understand why. And then it became something else. It became, see, I'd never faced, um, you know, I knew there was, you know, I was not women's lib, but I was the ones I was burning my bra in college too. I was a right. terror. I was climbing over, you know, fences to break parietals and break the curfew and stuff. And I thought that was what you did. Um, but I had never been seeing that much hatred. And by the way, it's still out there um, because yeah. I was female and I didn't understand it. And then Sean, it became something else immediately. It was like, no, this isn't right. And um, I'm not going to let any little girl think that now. And it was, uh, mm. and it was like, why? My mother always said, why or why not? And my mother always pushed me because I think she was caught in the World War II generation and sh she didn't do what she wanted to do. So there was a little drive that I got from my mother and I didn't understand it. I still don't understand it, but it's, um, um, it's something that I just wasn't, I wasn't going to take it as long as I could. And by the way, then what was I going to do? If I had right. allowed myself to get fired, um, who was going to support me? Uh, you, know, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, what was I going to do? Um, so right. I kind of had to, but it really, it really became something when it was, that it was so obvious that because I was a female, I was a moron. And it was something that really bothered me, still bothers me to this day, obviously. Yeah. It is it is amazing though, Susan, when you when you look now, like do you do do you take some gratification though in being that pioneer for women? Because you look now, Katie Nolan and Jenny Kavnar and some of these women that are out there doing the doing the play by play, doing the color commentating. You know, you were kind of you were you you were kind of the first one to do it. Um, do you feel a sense like now you see so many more women? When now we have women coaches in the big leagues. We have you know. Do you do you feel a sense of man? You know what? It's things are starting to turn here in this game. Do you know when my first radio game was, Sean? 1992. You know how long ago that is? Yeah, 30 and years now ago. now we're talking about being yeah. coaches. It's, 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 I'm very gratified. When, when <clears throat> the people giving the assignments and hiring the women are women and not men trying to decide what is going to be palatable to a male audience, then I'll think it's changed. Mm. And right now, I, I, I don't. I mean, there's, right. there's more... But there's still so many are like in a little box. And I think that so many people that are hiring women think that the goal is to get women there. That's not the goal. The mm. goal is to make them better. And it's like, phew, we've got a woman on this broadcast. Great. Well, somebody tell her what to do. To do. Somebody yeah. tell her um, how to grow and how to make it so that um, – that that it that it perpetuates itself and you know to me it's never enough i guess and maybe that's who i am because um once you're satisfied with something you might as well quit because right. someone else will do it better right. um, I, I i don't i see it in basketball i see a couple of women that are in the nba that are flat out unbelievable and you forget that a, i want this i want people to forget who is talking I want people to right. listen to it like it's um, background noise. And if it's the voice of a woman, and there are two in one Milwaukee and one in Philadelphia, uh, right. and they are flat out great. And within two seconds, you forget that a woman is talking to you. And that's what I need to see. I don't want, um, it's like every time a woman does something, whoever hires them is applauding themselves and right. say, boy, we did it. And then they forget about it. Right. And, <clears throat> And that's so it's not enough for me, but maybe it's never going to be enough. I got to tell you one thing I don't like when they had these all women things. I don't know one woman who ever said, I want my own. We want to be part of something. And, right. you know, separation and um, separation has never been equal. It never was. It never will be. And that bothered me. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, it really bothered me. It's like everyone was saying, wow, we're going to congratulate ourselves. We have all women on this. And then, well, so what? There isn't anyone who went into this business thinking, I want my own all woman broadcast. Nobody. Right. We just right. want to be part of the game that we love. Yeah, well, oh, well, I, I think that's true too. Like I, I thought the same thing. If you're good, you're good, right? And and you're really good. Like when you listen to the Yankee broadcast, you're like, this is a great broadcast. You know, you and John Sterling, you do your thing. People tune in, like Chinch was saying, tune in to listen to you guys, which is which is 
you know, pretty awesome. What about you as far as when you became, you know, becoming the, the day-to-day color commentator? Like, what was that? We always talk about what you're getting called up to the big leagues. We always ask guys, what was that call like? When, they, when, when you got that job, what was that like when you found out you were, you were going to be the color commentator? You know, I, I think it was a couple of things. And one, um, I said when, when this happened, and it was because um, a lot of things happened, but um, – I think I, the first thing in my mind was everyone, and I mean, this is my 36th year here. Wow. And um, 30, WFAN just had its 35th anniversary, so as like in ballplayers' lives, it's an extra season. I started, my voice started being heard in New York in 87. People had gotten used to me by the time um, it was 2005. I, had, I was on Yes before that. And when I was on WFAN, I was on all the time because that was way back when we broke stories. Now nobody breaks stories. Anymore. Right. But back then, you'd hear me at two o'clock in the morning. And, you know, I'd be drinking with some manager and I'd find something else. I'd call them. <laughs> we did that too back then. <laughs> you could get the dirt, the yeah. real dirt back in the day, right? Well, you know what? With some of these managers, and I won't say who, but I will, but I'm, Dal- I'm talking about Dallas Green. <laughs> um, but if you didn't drink with some of these guys, you got nothing. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, it's, it, we'd be pouring drinks in the pot, potted plants. You know, <laughs> No, I was throw the shot, that. throw the shot over your shoulder trick. Well, <laughs> I was here. Billy Martin was my first manager here. I mean, like, and, oh my God. Give us a Billy Martin story, please. Give you have to have one Billy Martin I, story. No, I just, I loved Billy. I just loved Billy. He tested me once when, when I first met him, he was sitting with Art Fowler. I'll never forget where we were. We were in the indoor pool of that Sheridan Boston in Boston. Remember that? Off- oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, he went in and I introduced myself and, there she were, and he said, yeah. And he gave me something about, uh, oh, he said to me, all right, you're from Boston. I see. So, you uh, um, Phil Rizzuto and Johnny Pesky, give me a story about the two of them. And I said, well, okay, but I know that, uh, that uh, Johnny Pesky used to put, fr- they used to put the gloves on the field and they left them there in between innings. Yeah, that's in right. Days. And I said, well, um, Uncle Johnny told me that he used to leave like little frogs in Phil Rizzuto's <laughs> club. And, and he said to me, how do you know that? Wow. And I said, well, because Uncle Johnny told me. <laughs> <laughs> And he smiled and he laughed. And that was, that was, I never had a moment's disease with Billy Martin. Um, I really loved him. He was really, really so smart. And you could see his mind working and you'd ask him a question and he'd answer you. And I never had a problem with any of, any, any of those people, by the way. Um, but it was, um, that was my, that was my introduction to Billy Martin. And I did learn about Billy when he didn't like a question. And he'd look at him, well, what would you do, pal? <laughs> pal, and, uh-oh, we're, you know, I'm either going to leave or there's going to be somebody flying through the door. And, I, <laughs> and there was the story of Billy trying to put one of the beat reporters into those big dryers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Wait, and, and for real, wait, for real. Like he was, was he fighting the B reporter? Well, he picked him up and he tried to stop. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> no, you can't do that anymore. You have Times have changed. Yeah. Yeah, really, yeah. really <laughs> Times have changed. When you, uh, Susan, when you first broke in with WFAN and you know, I think nowadays, it, I think we have, we, it's, the day and age of just having to be so careful about saying anything. Right. I mean, I think so, but back then when you were at WFEN, you know, especially in 87 and you know, late eighties, were you allowed to, you know, was it, a, was it a lot more loose than you, you could really just be you, you have such a big personality and sit, you know, you're such, you know, w- could you just be yourself and say some things maybe that you couldn't in this days? Um, well, this is pretty much me. I mean, I can't do what I, you know, I am. I, don't, I did take, a, I must admit, I did take a, a six-week journalism course at some school in the city so I wouldn't get sued because I knew what you could say. But once Don Imus came to WFAN, I was fine. Oh, all I mean, right. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> no, but they, they did it. And, and I'm not, you know, I'm really underneath this. I am a very, you know, Puritan Bostonian. And I, we don't say a lot. I mean, right. Uh, yeah. No. It was. It. I. The whole thing was was very very different. And and as you know, um, we were part of it back then. You know, in yeah. those nineties, I was 
you know, those people, I'm still friends with those people. I've gone to their kids' weddings. It's just, wow. it's very, very different now. And it, and I think it's because of social media and all the coverage. But back then, you know, when you played, your beat guys were there. They were on the plane. They were on the bus. They yep. were part of the family. And by the way, what is missing is because the relationship isn't the same, trust me, we protected guys. And you know yeah. that. And, Big you know, time. And, the, you know, there were guys that I, and this one guy, I remember we were in Milwaukee. I saw him about to get in a fight in a bar. And I walked in. I said, time to go. And, you know, that's those were, and you know those stories. And beat, yeah. beat people were part of that. And now it's a little different. As you yeah, know. Well, the, the beat writers were part of the team. You know, they're on your foot. They do everything with you. And I, I always respected that because you could tell – you know, even in articles that were written, you know, especially the guys that were always fair, you're like, man, this guy's protecting me or this guy, you know, he likes me or, or man, this is my buddy. You know, like I said, he, we, right. we're playing 162 games. These guys are with us all the time. Here's, here's a great thing. You know how I got on the plane on the, on the charter? 1988, right. I remember saying to George, George, I, I can't I can't do this. Can I go on the charter? And he said, I'm going to give you a test. I said, he said, Billy and Dave Rigetti have a fist fight on the plane. Do you put it on the air? And I said, did anybody get hurt? And he said, no. And I said, then it doesn't get on the air. And then he said, what do you mean? I said, if, Reg if Rigetti breaks his arm, it's going on the air. <laughs> said, yeah. He said, that's fair. And wow. that's how I got on the plane. So you know what? I know what went on on those planes. <laughs> <laughs> But if somebody that was that was his test to say that if they had a fight, what would I do? If nobody got hurt, it doesn't get on the air. If somebody if, if Forgetty walks off the plane with his arm in a cast, somebody's <laughs> gonna find out. So I might as well break yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Like well, that answer. I love and so 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 you're so what was it like with George Steinbrenner? I mean, like I mean, I mean, what was he like? What was your relationship like with him? Obviously, he loved that answer and, and let you on the flight. But you know, when you talk Billy Martin, I got to think Steinbrenner. They go hand in hand. You know, it's like peanut butter and jelly. Well, <laughs> um, except for my mother and my grandfather, there is no one more important in my life than George Steinbrenner. And wow. I mean, this is a story, and I'll, I'll tell you what that was. And I guess it was 88. Um, George liked to take the beat writers out for Christmas lunch. He'd come to New York and they'd go. And I was then with my little tape recorder, and I was a, a and I would like follow him. Um, in the, I'd go, Mr. Steinbrenner, Mr. Steinbrenner, this is 87 when I started, and George would get into the elevator. You weren't allowed to get into the elevator if George was in there. So I'd wait. Oh, really? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> And wait, no, no, if he was in there, no one could get in. If no one could get in. No, not, not the press. I mean, not the press, yeah. Not the press. But, and so what I would do is run up the ramps. And if I would get to the office before the elevator door opened, he would talk to me. And that's and I did that for a half a summer. I mean, running up the stairs like. A, well, how did you how did you figure that out? What well, had to be a first a first of that? I have no idea. I <laughs> I don't, I told you, I don't like someone saying no. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm going to take off and just sprint up these steps and be <laughs> time better to the office. I ran the up. ramps. Oh yeah, the ramps. <laughs> and so that was how that started. And that winter, um, <laughs> he had this luncheon and I called the PR director and I said, why aren't I invited? They're going to 21. I love 21. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, you're not a beat reporter. I said, of course I am. And he said, well, you're also a girl. And I said, I, I know that. But I know. <laughs> I can go to 21. And so I wasn't invited. So what I did was call the head of sales, WFAN, and I said, I want you to do something for me. Find out what my five o'clock Yankee report sells for and how many people listen. So he gets it and it turns out that more people listen to me at 5.05 every afternoon than read every single paper in the Tri-State area. And I wrote a letter to George and I said, I am coming down to Tampa and this is why I am important and all that. And this is what it sells for. And I won an interview. And I took, gave him the number of the hotel. It was a spa. I didn't tell him that, but he knew. <laughs> and I got down and the, phone, and the little light was blinking. Do they still have the little blinking lights? And yeah, they saw. The, yes. Well, it was blinking, and it was George's secretary, Terry, and she said, "Mr. Steinbrenner, I'll see you tomorrow at nine o'clock." And by the way, I have xeroxed that letter and given it to every woman in the building. And there I was, and I walked in, and you're going to love this because this started my relationship with George. 
he, I walked in and he said, all right, now I got to tell you one thing. I don't like women cops. I don't like women firefighters. I don't like women in sports and I don't like women in the army. I like women to look pretty and spend my money. And oh my out of my mouth came, okay, I can do that. Now about the starting rotation. <laughs> and he started laughing. Wow. And we sat down, and it was it was great, and that's how that started. Oh, and um, so great, that is yeah. so great. You just were playing his game with him back. Yeah. At- yeah. Oh, but George, that's who I am. I'm sorry. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. like I don't know you. You all the I don't care. I don't work for you. I mean, wow. um, but there was something, and people that are in that position of power don't like yes people around them they say they do but they don't they don't wow. his yeah. wife dick michael was always around and mm. till the day he died was a i mean it was very important to george that um people would say what are you talking about and if you you know and i was on the other end of those calls too i mean he was very mercurial and um Sometimes I'd say something on the air and I'd say, oh, my God, I'm dead. I'm just dead. And he never said a thing. And one day he called and I had said something about the bus being late in Seattle. And he said, what are you doing telling us other thing? You're cut off, Waldman. Slam. <laughs> and I picked up the phone and I called him back and I said, don't you hang up on me. And I <laughs> Wow. And this, this went on for a while, and then he wouldn't call back. And I'd wait a day or two, and then I'd call him up again. He'd say, what do you want, Waldman? I said, oh, thank you for the flowers. You're for the flowers. And, wow. and he never said flowers. But over the years, I thanked him for flowers, candy. Once I thanked him for medley. I mean, but that was, you know, he was, he was like that. And it was, um, so he was, he was always there. And George had a lot to do with my getting my being on yes and my um, being on the radio. And, wow. But wow. George wanted at that year in '88, he did say something, and this was before my death threats, and this was before all the stuff that happened. He said, "One of these days, Waldman, I'm going to make a statement about women in sports. You're it, and I hope you can take it." He knew what was coming. I did. And it was, wow. and George was like that. He wanted to make a statement, but he was going to make sure that um, that I wasn't going to be scared off, or that I was going to, I was that I was going to make it. You know what he used to do? You know, <laughs> George would. He told. I found this out years later. He would go into bars like Runyon's. Remember Runyon's back then? Yeah. Yep. He'd go in and he'd have a hat on and a raincoat and he'd sit at the bar like no one knew who it was. And he'd like, I was either on MSG or PIX back then. And he'd say to the people in the bar, he said, what do you think of that girl? Like nobody knew it was George, right? I mean, <laughs> what do you think of that girl? And he told me the answer was always the same. That it was, well, I don't like women sportscasters, but she's actually okay. Wow. Oh, it's just like wow. a huge compliment from him, yeah. I guess, right? And that was, no, but he was, he didn't tell me that till years later. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, um, it was that he, you know, he wanted to make sure. He was going to wow. make sure that I was going to be accepted. And then he would back whatever I did. He was very good like that. He wow. was very good at that, but very, very mercurial. But, Amazing. you know, I, Love guys like that. But I mean, so, they're people. They're oh, just- <laughs> those teams, those teams you broke in with had some of the greatest, biggest personalities. In yeah, first of all, in my argument, the greatest one through four in a lineup ever: Henderson, Randolph, Manningly, Winfield. You break in with that team, Manningly wow. and Winfield were, and Ricky, the, the, some of the biggest names in baseball. How did they treat you? And and did you gain their trust, or did you have to gain their trust too? Um, well, I think it was a little shocking for everybody. Well, you have a team and Don Mattingly is the captain. There's not going to be, don't forget, uh, Ron Guidry was there and yeah. Eddie was there and Mike Pagliarulo was there. Wow. And wow. no, I never had a moment's problem. I will tell you some, Ricky Henderson was actually, um, I don't know if he still doesn't remember my name, but you know, he'll hug me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, but Ricky Henderson was actually my, my first friend on that team. And, uh, and um, he was the first player that ever said to me, um, why are you doing this? What, what? And, and I said, when we get to Fenway Park, I'll, I'll show you. And, um, and we got to Fenway Park and it wasn't, I don't know whether it was rebuilt by the time you got there, Sean, but when I was there, when I was a little girl, yeah. Um, those two front rows that are in next to the, they, they weren't there. So the front row was actually um, right 
by the entrance of the on deck circle and it was tiny. There was no monster seats and there were no second deck and third deck. It was tiny. And I took Ricky and I, my seat was in the first row next to the Red Sox on deck circle. And I could literally reach out and touch Ted Williams, literally, because that's where. Wow. And I took Ricky to that seat. And this is 87, maybe. And I said, look around, pretend all that stuff is in here. And now pretend you're four years old. Oh. And and Fenway Park is as special a place as that there is on this earth, really. I mean, and, and they've done it, it really a is. Lot to make it better. But back then, and you knew you really, and I was telling them that I knew everyone in the park and I'd wave. And I mean, it was just, it was a really special place. Um, Dave Winfield did, I'll tell you what that group did too. Um, the people that didn't accept me immediately were um, the other reporters. I sat in that press box for a solid year and nobody talked to me. I mean, nobody. And the other radio, the other radio reporters, they, they always say it's the players and women in the locker room. It's not. Um, it's your colleagues who, one, don't want you there because I was told I was taking a job away from a real reporter. And um, when that year, um, a lot of nice things happened. You had really good and really bad. A couple in that clubhouse, one in a Toronto clubhouse that I do want to get to because that's, that's a special one. Um, it was a day Ricky and Willie Randolph had been both out. I mean, they were both hurt. And Dave Winfield had been in an awful slump. They were both back and they came back the same day and Winfield like went three for five and had all these RBIs. And I was so excited. I was going to ask my first question about Ricky and Willie being back, the setup guys and him there. And I started and it was the first time that I'd ever asked a question. And the other beat guys are like, <clears throat> and making funny. And I started and I made a mistake and I'm thinking, do I start again and admit I made a mistake or do I keep going and not be able to use the tape? And as I'm thinking that, Dave Winfield pressed the button on my big Morantz and said, can we do that again? I don't like how I answered that last question. I don't want it on the air. He knew. And so I just, it was an odd, and I reminded him and I don't think he remembered, but I just, I mean, how can you not adore someone? It was an instinct. He didn't know me. I mean, he, he knew that I made a mistake and he knew that they were waiting to get me. Oh, and wow. he just, it was, and I've never forgotten it. It helps, that, helps that he was six, seven and nobody would mess with that dude back then. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's also, he didn't have to do that. I mean, I wasn't, and um, the other thing in 87, and this is a chapter in a children's book. And I went into the um, Toronto locker room, and that was a group '87. That was that was a difficult <laughs> locker room, anyway. But what I used to do, guys, is I would take a media guide and I would look at where people went to school, and so I knew, you know, I went, oh, Jeff Musselman, he went to Harvard. He's not going to yell at me. John <laughs> John Cerruti went to Amherst. He's got a degree in economics like me. We can talk about that. So I went and that's how I would talk to people because I knew that they would be nice to me. And I was talking to Cerruti about stuff, not economics, but, um, and I see that the New York writers are going over to George Bell, who um, was not John Cerruti. And George <laughs> Bell had not talked to the New York writers all year because he thought that the New York writers had kept him from getting the MVP in 86. So that September, he decided to talk. So I went over and I said, excuse me, I've got to talk to Albert Einstein. He's got many things to say. And I went over there and he saw me and started screaming in English and Spanish, the most hideous things I've ever heard. And, and I won't talk until she's out of this clubhouse. And the whole place went silent and waited for me um, to get out. And I was not like this back then. And I just saying, just my little skirt, and my little tape recorder, yeah. just let me get out of here before I start to cry. And I started to go to the door and I hear in back of me, what's her name? And somebody said, Oh, Susan something. And I hear Susan and I turned around and it was Jesse Barfield. And <sighs> she said, um, I went three for four today. Don't you want to talk to me? And it wow. was a single, we're a chapter in a children's book and, and Marla and Jesse Barfield and I have been friends now for 35 years. And it was just, I mean, he went against a teammate. He didn't know me, never seen me before, but he thought it wasn't fair. And why is he doing that? He didn't tell me that George Bell and he didn't talk for a long time after that. I mean, they're fine. Wow. Now, but, um, you know, so there were people like that in every 
clubhouse, there was somebody who would who would do that. Well, almost every clubhouse. Um, yeah. But it was um, that was that was tough. That those kinds of things were very tough. But I really did that with the media guys. I really. Wow. Did that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, funny. This guy, this guy looks nice. This guy, this guy's you background. Know, well, in basketball, you looked for people from North Carolina because they could all yeah. talk. Or no, and football. It was Notre Dame. No one from Notre Dame is everybody yeah. religion. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, that's what I did. I had guys on the Jets, and got that, that. I looked for Notre Dame, and at that time in basketball, Dean Smith, everybody would would talk and be wonderful. So you always looked for North Carolina. <laughs> that's so great! Oh my gosh, that's so great. When you look at your career now, you know what are some of the best memories that you have? calling the games you know um gosh some of them don't don't um entail calling a game i think my my bet the the thing that made my career was being in the upper deck in the san francisco earthquake in 1989 and my phone oh, wow out. i was on the entire time and that was the first time i was ever taken seriously I was wow. a, a, a lot and I stayed there and did city side stuff for a couple of weeks and um, we were in the upper deck <laughs> and, and I remember thinking as the thing is going on, I said, we're going to be okay because we're going to fall down, but we're going to fall on other people. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> but, you know, it was, um, and, 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 I, and that was, you know, that was very memorable getting back to the, oh, here, I'm going to bring this all oh back. My God. <laughs> when, Coming out of the earthquake in 89, I realized after being on the air for an hour that I had no way to get back to San Francisco and I didn't know where I went and I didn't know where I was. Get back to the hotel in San Francisco. I had no idea where I was and didn't know anybody. The guy who Billy Martin tried to put in a in a dryer found me on the street. And that's how I got back. So that's <laughs> um Oh my God! I think the World Series, obviously, in two thousand and nine, because I was the first woman ever to do a World Series. But I think my greatest joy was Jeter's three thousandth, because I cried through the whole thing, and yeah. Don and I were both crying. <laughs> you know, just think, I had met this kid when he was eighteen, and I there there is an iconic picture that is up. Um, Derek Jeter had two smiles; they're almost the same, but they're not. And one is for us, and the other is for his family only. And I learned it really early. It's almost, and Jorge Posada does it beautifully. He does both smiles. And, <laughs> and what does he do on each smile? I have to look this up. Well, <laughs> no, it's the same, but it's, there's a, my mother had that. I used to call my mother's smile a teacher's smile. Right, right. <laughs> She's smiling, but there's something else going on. Man. <laughs> there is an iconic picture that they got after Jeter's 3000th, and he's waving to his family. And there's a smile on it. And I said, I hope somebody got that smile. It was on wow. television, and they did. And you see it. He's looking up. It was right after the 3000th hit, and he's looking up at his mom and dad and, and his sister, Charlie. And there's that Jeter warm smile i'm not you know it's, it's fine yeah it's like i have a smile for strangers also <laughs> i know exactly what you're and saying I have yeah a smile for my german shepherd who <laughs> yeah. so but that's i think that and you know that that world series and i think a lot of the um the great moments that i've had are not calling games but interviewing um mm. people and I mean, I was thinking of something was they were announcing the home run derby people and I'm listening and I'm thinking I was in a clubhouse interviewing Josh Hamilton when he said I, ha I had a dream less. It was before the home run derby that year. And he said, I had a dream that I made it back and I was going to be I was going to win the home run derby and I was going to be interviewed by a woman. Is that going to be you? And what? I, no. Yeah. No, this is true. And he said, no, but it was, he talked to me about the dream that he had. And I thought of that when they, you know, on MLB network, they have the whole that. And I saw his face and I remember that there are so many moments like that, where I'll tell you a little secret about women in this game, Yeah, you play your cards right. And they trust you. You will get things out of a man that they will never say to another man. If I say to you, Sean, what in God's name were you swinging at? You'll tell me. If a yeah. guy asks you, you'll probably say, why? What would you have done? 
Yeah, <laughs> that's but true. It, and it's and it really is. And some of the um, interviews I've gotten are much more um, impressive. When Roger Clemens won his 300th game, I had it all. I was with Yes, and I had it all set up. Um, we were going to be on the air, and I had a phone. And I loved his mom. I loved his mom, Mama Bess, and she couldn't travel. And I had a phone set up so that we could talk to Mama Bess, and Roger didn't know. And oh. uh, those kinds of moments to me, and the kids were babies. I mean, they were little. <laughs> <laughs> now Cody's hitting home runs. In the big leagues, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but those kinds of things, see, that's why I got into sports. It's not because I wanted to call a game. I wanted people to understand the humanity and what it takes to perform and what you go through when you fail. I mean, the mm. same thing that put a bat in your, your hand, Sean, in front of thousands and in a yeah. series, millions of people, is the same thing that makes me stand in front of a, an audience and maybe fail and maybe fall mm. down and maybe hit wrong notes or sing the anthem in front of millions of people in a World Series. It's the same person. It's just the stage is totally different. So I always thought that I could get people more humanized. And hmm. you know that sort of is gone with the wind now. But I try. I still I still yeah. try because I I think it's important. I think it's because then all you've if if all we've got is stats and this is what you did and this is your OPS and this is your whip and your war and all that other crap. Right. I mean, right. if that's all you are, just sit home and play with your computer and don't bother don't bother me. I and mean, no. that's why people boo so much. And that's you know. It, it, it's just different, but they're still people. They're still human beings that mm -hmm. don't want to be made fun of and have to take an awful lot. And I know they're getting paid a lot of money. I understand it, but it's still a person. And I just think yeah. it would be better if we, if we knew these people. And if you yeah. find what, what made you do that? Why did you, why did you make that play? Why, what mm -hmm. were you thinking? And I think if somebody understands that, then they don't boo as much and they don't it's fascinating to me. And I just, you know, I keep trying. I'm, yeah. <laughs> being, out, I'm being shouted down all over the place. But oh. I'm trying. No, Susan, you're doing a great job. And that's the truth from a player's point of view. Like, it's the hero's journey. Like, at the end of the day, I know I'm on TV. I know I make millions of dollars. But, like, I'm still that little kid that loved baseball, that wants to perform, that wants to do well. And, you know, I can remember one time really quick when I was with the Red Sox in Toronto. It was my first starts with Boston. I was like, oh, yeah. And I came in the eighth inning. I think I tied it up at four. So we go to the bottom of the eighth. Greg Zahn comes up, bases loaded, one out. And I'm, like, going through my mind. Okay, if it's hit hard to my right, I'll turn two. If it's soft, I'll come in, I'll come home. By the time I'm going through that, Susan, first pitch Zahn, first pitch <laughs> swing, it hits a, hits a rocket to me. It it hits, it hits the, the lip uh, coming off, clanks off my glove, goes down the right field line, all three runs score, right? 6-3. I'm like, first off, I'm like, oh, my God, Boston media after the game. That's what I'm thinking. Like my first, And then, but then the second thing I'm thinking, 50,000 in the Sky Dome start chanting, Casey, Casey, you suck for 10 minutes. I'm like, oh, my God, just get me out of here. <laughs> it's just so funny. Like that human element. It's my 10th year in the big leagues. No, I'm like, I just want to go home. I just want to get off this field. <laughs> I just want to get off this that's field. Why, that's what this is. That's why people love sports. That's yeah. why, you know, and I'm sure that that bothered you. I mean, it, big I time. In the page, but I'm sure you didn't sleep that night. But that's what makes <laughs> sport. That's why we go to the game because those moments happen. Right. No one like that in Toronto to say somebody sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, that's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm afraid we lose and that it's bothersome to me. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So good. Um, what I want to, I want to touch on just uh, a little bit about this team this year because they're really good. I just, I just was able, you guys were in Pittsburgh. I was able to um, get together with my man, Aaron Boone's like one of my great friends in the game, played six years with him in Cincinnati and love him to death. And he's so excited about this team. Like, and I think there's a lot of comparisons. I say, Oh man, that 98 team was so good. And there's a lot of comparisons, you know, with this team, you know, what do you see with the 2022 Yankees that you really, Really love and and that maybe is there any comparison back to some of those that 98 team okay well the fact that they're winning yes yeah. so I don't like to compare there's a different group right different time they do different things that team had an entire pitching staff of seasoned veterans I mean right. let's, let's take that 98 team but 
them over there, keep them safe. And don't forget that 98 team started with Mariano falling in a hole in San Diego State That's at Tony right. Gwynn's um, baseball field. It was out for six weeks. The team started one and three. Joe was going to get fired. George had to get to fire him. And then that they, and Paul O'Neill and David Cohn called a meeting in Seattle at that hideous kingdom thing. And, and, and him saying, um, well, um, we're going to have this meeting. And that was the first time I ever heard a player's leaking a meeting because they wanted to get it in the paper so that George would find out that they were taking care of it so we wouldn't fire Joe. Did you know this? Do you all the No, things? that's a no, great this is one. Great. Uh, yeah. They they leaked it. I mean we've had players meetings forever and then somebody right. you know we you know we don't put it in the paper. That one got leaked to everybody because they wanted George to know that they did this. So Joe Torrey was not fired and the team went on. I don't like comparisons to a team because look who was on that team. My goodness. Right. I mean, you know, they'd already. They, so loaded. And by the way, that 98 team came in loaded for bear because they were so angry about 97. Mm. I've never, that plane ride back from Cleveland was the worst when they got eliminated by Cleveland in 97. It was, except for the 95 plane ride with everybody crying and Don Mattingly saying goodbye to everybody when they, oh. when they came back before Buck was fired. That Cleveland plane ride was something. And they came in in 98 and something was different. And that that was, I don't like the comparisons. What I do see is um, everybody buying in to a way that uh, Aaron Boone and the Yankees want them to play. I watch Aaron Judge being better. I watch Giancarlo Stanton being becoming a hitter. I watch, um, and the stories are great. Nestor Korstas is a great story. I mean, that yeah. is just the best. And people right. like that. And um, Kiner Falefa coming in and when he makes an error saying, I mean, he gets to balls that most people don't get to. And then sometimes he has errant throws or he bounces it. And he'll say, I've got to, I've got to be better. Um, I watched like Josh Donaldson make Make a decision to come home instead of go for a double play. Um, if I don't think he would have gotten the double play run, would have scored. He took this sure out. I watch him. I was told he went into Aaron Boone and asked asked him, "Did I make the right decision?" I love that. I just love yeah. that stuff. I mean, they're talking. They're, watch them in the dugout. They're always together. They're always talking about edges, and they come back like the '98 team did. Mm -hmm. I don't like to make comparisons. Um, it's different because those guys in 98 were horses. I mean, nobody had yeah. a touchdown on Roger Clemens. Nobody had right. a touchdown on David Code. I mean, it was just, it was a different, it was a different time. Um, you know, I'm glad you're in Pittsburgh and what I see, and this is what's happening with Cincinnati. Um, after the first game in Pittsburgh where they had Bill Mazeroski throw out the first pitch and it was his bobblehead night and Pittsburgh beat the Yankees, this team that is just, you know, not, not very good and rebuilding. Yeah. I got lost in that tunnel and ended up going to the wrong place. And there were some guys that I know in the Pirates that said to me, you know, this was game 80 for you guys. This is game one of our World Series. Wow. And they played and I'm watching Cincinnati doing the same thing. They, um, I mean, there was, I said to Booney yesterday, I said, you know, there are people, Joey Votto is, is a great player. I'm sorry he's getting older and I'm sorry he's not, but he's not having a bad series now. And, <laughs> I'm, watching guys, and I'm watching Jonathan India, who all of a sudden has turned back into the guy that, that was the rookie of the year. These people have, have pride and they're playing the Yankees and they know they're not going anywhere. So they get in the Yankee stadium and there's 45,000 people screaming and they go, whoa, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> and they forget that they were out at Monument Park, these kids, and taking pictures and stuff. Say, I, I love this stuff. I, you know, I'd rather they wait till they left New York. But I, under, <laughs> yeah. I, under, I understand it, and it's yeah. that to me. See, nobody talks about that. Nobody mm -hmm. talks about must what must be going through the mind of some of these veterans that are still mm -hmm. on Cincinnati that did not get traded, and are at the end of their careers. And 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 it's 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 fascinating to me. That's the stuff that yeah. I don't want to get lost. Well, there's something about, I know for me, even I, I can still remember 2005 when you guys came into Cincinnati. I believe it was 2000, no, it was 2003. 2003, the Yankees came into Cincinnati, and it's just something about playing the Yankees because the crowds are different. The Yankee fans travel well. You know, there is something as a veteran player, man, like, okay, you know, we're not doing that well, but the Yankees are down, <laughs> and, and we got to up our game a little bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, well, they did, that in, they did that in Pittsburgh. They had, yeah. they had the biggest crowds they've had in years 
at, yeah. that, at that that first game they couldn't have they didn't have it for opening day they hadn't they had nothing like that and it was and i understand it and yes yankee fans go everywhere uh, yeah. but but if you're a player and you're playing in front of five thousand people every single night i mean that's oh. you know, they say it doesn't matter that's got to be horrible i mean I've it matters nightclubs where my parents were the only people in there <laughs> <laughs> Hey, by You're the way, like, mom and dad, how am I doing? How am I doing? <laughs> hey, we never break news on this show, but the Yankees just made a trade. How ironic is this? I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. They got Tyler Wade back from the Angels for a player to be named later. Just now. <laughs> With really? Susan on our show. Being, that's oh, unbelievable. Wow. Well, <laughs> wow. That's, that's, they, they DFA'd him. And of course, I've known Tyler Wade since. I, I got a great Tyler Wade story for you. I'm not hey. going to work today. I'm just going to <laughs> <laughs> and I first knew, and and Tyler Wade was DFA'd by the Angels, and that's his home, and now he's back. Is he coming to, or is he going to, well, he hasn't played no else. He's probably that's going to AAA. Do we know? Great question. Hold on. Let's look. All right. Well, this is I'll fun. keep going. Yeah. <laughs> See, um, <laughs> when I first met Tyler Wade, he was in A-ball, and he'd come to his first spring training, and he was a shortstop, and I knew he was a shortstop, and this is how I knew the game had really changed for these kids, is that I went over to him, and I said, I introduced myself, and I said, um, I see you're playing second base today. Is that okay with you? Well, of course it's okay with me. And he started giving me chapter and verse on how when you're an infielder, you have to, because of the shifts, you have to play everything. And then he tells me how he got his, onto his high school team because he was they had a shortstop, and so he was not on the team because the shortstop was a senior and he wasn't going to, but the third baseman got sick. And they asked him, can you play third base? He said, sure, I can play third base. That's how he never had done it before. Oh, my God. He, see, who, who's Tell you Unbelievable. This. <laughs> That's a great story. This. This going so to AAA, great. according to Heyman. Going to AAA. Oh, my God. He's going, going to AAA. AAA. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. so good. But he I wanna, was, uh, yeah. Susan. I want to, I want to, before, you know, we're, we're winding down, but I want to make sure when I go back to 98 and you talk about Joe Torrey, what was so great about Joe Torrey? Oh, boy. Um, er, everything. He's like, and I don't, every, there are a lot of managers that are different. But that team, um, they had already really been developed by Buck Showalter. The team was there. And when he got here, and this is 96, um, John Zimmer said, we got to do something. We got to get a defensive catcher. And they traded Mike Stanley, who was really popular. <laughs> and they got Joe Girardi. And poor Girardi was was I'm, I'm getting to it um yeah. Girardi was booed at the fan fest and you know had a terrible time here but he turned out to be to me 96 team the mvp is joe Girardi. they went wow. to the highest that was david cohn's aneurysm year that was he was unbelievable that year and so they got him in there but that as these guys became stars joe tory was the perfect person nobody expected anything in 96 and he was one been there done it all and everybody, you know, he never changed his, you never saw the jaw going, you know, you never saw him nervous. Andy Pettit once said to me, I asked him, you know, do you ever get nervous out there? And, you know, and he comes out and he talks to you and, and he said, no, Mr. Torrey doesn't get nervous. So why should I? Get nervous? <laughs> wow. And that was what he did. He would oh. go things, do, do things. Remember what Alan Watson, left-handed reliever? Sure. Oh, yeah. Alan Watson. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is Joe. Um, they brought in. Alan Watson and Joe said, walk him. And so he walks the guy, Joe comes and gets him and goes and says, Wadi, you're all over the place. I got to take you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was... And then there was obviously the relationship between Joe who and Derek Jeter, who never called him anything but Mr. Tory and Mr. T. Um, Derek Jeter got thrown out at third on a really um, unfortunate steal attempt. And Jeter goes and he, goes back to the dugout and he sits like this next to Joe and he just sits there and you go, you see Joe go, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but he just had that way it was, and by the way, he knew baseball like nobody's business. I mean, this was an MVP right. of the National League and he had an right. answer for everything. The other thing he did, I have seen nobody handle the media like Joe Torrey nobody and we would have sessions other media would come in and and, and say um you do 45 minutes with joe tory every day so if he wants to 
And because that day, that would mean that either George was going to yell at somebody or he wanted to keep the press away from somebody or and he would just take it. And no question was stupid and nothing was in you sat and you talked to him. And he was and still is incredible. One of the dearest people I've ever met in my life. I love him dearly. And he was perfect for them. He was the perfect, perfect person for that time. Yeah, I would say, wow, incredible, incredible. Um, boy, I I have, I honestly, I I appreciate your time because we, I feel like we could do this for seven hours. I have so many other things, but we do, we end the show. We do a, we do a thing called nine and 90. It's just a fun thing. Chinch has these nine questions. He'll ask him, Chinch, are you going to ask him to me first? And then Susan will respond. I'll ask you first. And then Susan, you just pick it up right off his answers with your answers. Okay. 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 By the way, this is a great honor for me. I met my wife yeah, in baseball, right. and see, I'm not kidding, Susan. You, you, you mean a lot to me and my family. My dad's flipping out that we got you on. <laughs> Screw like yeah, Pedro and grandfather. Smoltz and all those guys. Great grandfather. Right? Yeah, no. well, I'm the. I am probably the only person that can that knows that has seen all four generations of Boons. Oh, that's right. great. That's a great you point. Saw, did, yep. Wait, did you see Ray? I. What you want me to tell your race? Yes, yeah, please, please tell me. Ray Boone, the Red Sox back then um, had, they had a penchant for getting people at the end of their careers. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember sitting there with my grandfather and I don't mind telling him, but I am the same age as Bob Boone. Okay. And, yeah. and I know that, I know that because I was friends with the Lomborgs and uh, Bob Boone actually introduced Jim Lomborg to his wife, Rosemary. You didn't know this, did you? See? No, this is great. Yeah. This okay. is so great. So here's, here's what I remember. Ray Boone came over at the end of his career. He played first base. By the way, became as good a scout for the Red Sox till the day he died. I mean, the list of people that he signed is, was unbelievable. He was great. Anyway, wow. he comes over and he's playing first base. And my grandfather said, and the team was not very good, not very good at all. And my grandfather said, you know, he's got a son. He's 12. I think he's a catcher. Maybe they meant to get him instead. Come on. I swear to God. Oh I my God. God. So that was, yeah. So we, I go way back. Anyway. Wow. That's right. incredible. That's, that's unbelievable. Well, obviously, obviously Aaron knows that. Obviously Aaron knows that story, right? Aaron, Aaron just learned that story a couple of weeks ago. Wow. I can't believe it. I've never met his father. Wow. Oh, you've never met Bob? No, I knew Bob. Oh, Brett, I, and I hear Brett's got a kid that is um, at Princeton. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a real and Brett's daughter is and is engaged to an Oakland A. Oh, Tom. oh yeah, yeah, the outfielder. It, no, it uh, is. Hey, Alan, no, Alan, yeah, Alan. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's it. Infielder. Also, okay. is twelve. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> good, good player. We there's yeah. Yeah. good player plays short, plays base second. Wow. Hit. Good player. Yeah, good player. I, I'm for, I'm fortunate. The only boon that I didn't know was Ray, but I knew Bob managed me three years in Cincinnati. When I came when I came up with the Reds, Brett was the second baseman, so I was next to him at first. I was like, this guy's the cockiest player I've ever played with, but great guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously I played with Aaron for six years, so like, uh, you They're know, I'm right. Oh my God! They are so <laughs> different. It's not even you know close. The, you know, remember the savages in the in the box? Yeah. That Boone had. Yeah, yeah. I went yeah. into him afterwards, and I said, um, <laughs> "Is that really you, or did you just channel your brother there?" <laughs> 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 that's perfect. Yeah, that's more like Brett. Brett would do that. Definitely, it's not. All right, so perfect. Great. We snuck that one in. All right, nine and ninety. Ready? Hall of Fame baseball broadcaster Marty Brenneman here. It's time for nine and ninety, the most ridiculous segment in all of sports. Shawnee, are you a better <laughs> yeah. passenger or driver? Oh, I'm a better driver, I think, because I can't stand a passenger drivers anyhow. So, mm-hmm. driver. Susan. Oh, I can't. I can't sit in the passenger seat. My father used to say to me when I drive, when I'd sit in the passenger seat, the brake doesn't work on your side. <laughs> oh, like that. My mom. <laughs> All right, this is a tough one. Better Broadway show, Chicago or Wicked? Uh, oh, I've seen Wicked. I have never seen Chicago, so I'm going to have to say Wicked only because I've seen. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. Chicago is one of the best. <laughs> <laughs> it's very sweet. It's very yeah, I agree sweet. with Susan. Whatever they, she says in this question, I agree with her. <laughs> All right, this is a tough one. Best away city to visit during the season? Uh, Chicago. Just uh, I, At least for me, I just love going to Gibson's, getting a nice steak, and, you know, just uh, 
even I like shopping too on like Western or Michigan Avenue. I do, for whatever reason, I'd shop in Michigan. So I got problems, but so Chicago. <laughs> You shop on Michigan Avenue? <laughs> yeah, remember Michigan Avenue? Isn't it yeah, Michigan I Avenue in Chicago? I, oh, you must be very rich. <laughs> I was real. I was really rich then. I was really rich. <laughs> um, obviously, it's Boston because I don't get there a lot. But I lo- I also love Chicago, and um, I love I used to anyway. I love going to Seattle. Mm. Mm, yeah, Seattle's great too. All right, Sean, would you have a better chance of winning a spelling bee or a math bee? Uh, probably a math bee, because honestly, it's something about being a big league player or just uh, my whole life. It's just all about, okay, if I go four for 10 here, if I got 27 for the next 58, it's, it's crazy. So math. I'd win both of them. Actually. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> you cru- Hey, Susan, did you crush the SATs back in the day? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you, know what, you know why, I, you know why I, I took, I was on social probation at college. I have a degree in economics <laughs> in, from Simmons College in Boston. And I, I didn't go to class because it was across the street from, from Fenway Park. And I did shows at night. And so I never, I, I took, I, do, I majored in ec- economics and math because I didn't have to write any papers. <laughs> you either know it or you don't. Like, <laughs> That's so great. That's so great. <laughs> right, this is a good one. What's worse? A game start starting an hour late because of a rain delay, like the other night when it didn't rain, or a rain delay in the middle of a game. And then d- d- is the game get canceled? No, or, finish or- the game. Let's finish the game. Oh, man. The rain delays in the middle of the game, and then you got to stop and get going again. I just, that's the worst. I kind of like rain delays in the middle of a game because then I go to get to go sit in the other booth and talk to guys I haven't seen for a while. And, um, you know, I get to eat bad things. And rain delays at the beginning of a game. We lead the league and and always have in rain delays with no rain. We're really good at that. <laughs> and and, but I do understand because the storm was either going north or south or hitting us in the middle. Mm-hmm. And the last thing they wanted to do was to start Garrett Cole and have to stop in the second inning. Yeah, that's that a good point. Sense. That's good. My cousin was at the game. I got to tell him that's why they did it because he was not happy. <laughs> it's like a <laughs> six-year-old kid running I, around. I don't have confirmation on that. <laughs> like, if, like, like, my guess is that's what it's they common were sense. Yeah. 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 All right, a couple more. Messy desk or clean desk, Sean? Oh, I like a clean desk. Clean desk. Clean desk. Same here. Okay, two more. Skinny French fries or thick cut French fries? I like the, I like uh, I like uh, the, the skinny French fries. Well done. <laughs> but real potatoes. I don't like like McDonald's with like <laughs> with like the they're yellow. And I'm like, what the hell? Have you ever seen a yellow French fry? Like, what the heck's going on here? So I like real potatoes, skinny, crispy. I haven't had a French fry in 30 years. Do <laughs> I look like I've had a French no, fry? No, like, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last one. It's a tough one. <laughs> will Aaron Judge be a Yankee next year, and how much will he be paid? Yes, I think he'll be a Yankee, and they're going to up that salary to whatever it comes out to, seven for thirty-five. Yes, he'll be a Yankee, and it'll be one dollar more than whatever Mike Trout is getting. Wow, that's Ooh, a great wow. Wow, nice. Interesting. All right. Beautiful. All right, that was 990. Right. We did it. Oh, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, it's great. Susan, you are wonderful. Thank oh, you. Thank you for asking me. This is the best hour I've had in, in a long time. <laughs> that's great. That's great. We thank you so much. Literally, your personality is so good. You're so good at what you're doing. And uh, like I said, Chinch and his family are so grateful because <laughs> yeah, they're the biggest Yankee fans going. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, thank your family, uh, really you family, You still are the mayor. You're still fabulous. So <laughs> Thanks, awesome. Susie. You're the best. Hey, good luck to you, and we'll we'll see you down the road. And we appreciate your time today so much. Anytime. Thanks for asking. Okay, great, bro. How awesome was that? It was. I mean, Dude, I, seriously, no, no, seriously. I was thinking to myself. I looked at the climb. I'm like, oh man, we've hit an hour, and I'm like. I have so many things. I know. I want to go because she has, dude, she has so many good stories. She has such a great personality. Uh, She knows so much about baseball, so much about the game. She was a beat writer. She's in Mm -hmm. it. She's been on the sidelines. She's, she's, she's been on the radio, you know, with WFAN. That's always different. She's now, and now as a comment, it just like the wealth of knowledge. She's like uh, a baseball artifact. Right. How about she's also (laughs) hysterical. She's yes. super sweet, but what's the word you always say? Grit. How much grit did she have oh. to fight through the things? And she says she's still, and I, I really appreciated it. And her saying, like, you know, it, we're not there yet. 
we're not there yet. Keep keep fighting. Yeah. Keep just because you throw somebody on TV doesn't mean oh okay we're done. I, I thought that was an amazing analogy it. that you know like you and I don't get to think about <clears throat> things like that. We're not we're not in in, in yeah. their shoes, and it was just. Oh man, I'm just I'm proud of this one. I'm really. Sick. I I, I love I love how she was saying too. Like, what's listen, like we're not. What she's something like we're not curing cancer, or diabetes, whatever she right. said. And I, 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 the whole point is, hey, women know baseball. Women grow up about baseball. If you know baseball, you know baseball. Women know football. Women know right. women know basketball. Like, I'll, like come on, it's like let's stop I'll take with it the a hey, step it's a woman. Like, right. I'll take no. it a step further, okay? And I try always in my broadcasting career to do this. Like, yeah, oh, I played baseball in college. I try not to brag about that with you guys because I didn't play pro ball. So what's the difference between me and Susan? We, neither of us played. Neither of us right. have hit a major league fastball. But so why is she different? Why do I get more opportunities right. than she does over the course right. of the years? I, I didn't play the big leagues. No, I'd say 95% of the guys that walk into those clubhouses probably can't right. even jog up the <laughs> stairs, let alone totally tell agree. you how to hit a curveball. So and what's and the here's, difference here, there, you know? Here's the other thing, bro, that I loved what she said. She said sometimes for me... Cause I'm a woman, I get different answers out yeah, of these guys, cool. and I agree with that. You know, there's you're gonna like say something different to a woman reporter than you would say to a male reporter. So then you get into the, to the mind of a player. She brings that back to the radio in her commentary, and she yeah. goes, "Listen, I was talking to uh, you know, talking to Derek Jeter yesterday. He says, you know, that that." Two two slider. He's you know really been not seeing that yeah. well lately. You know he's a little anxious on his front side. Why can't you say that? You don't have to have been in a box exactly. to get the information you need yeah. to do a great commentary to be a great color person like Susan Waldman. Exactly. She's she's legit. <laughs> yes. Like there's no, no woman male like male no. female. No. Right. Susan Waldman. You want to hear a great game and you want to and you want to you want to hear great commentary. Bam. You got it. You know you got John Sterling and Susan Waldman to give yeah. you. The goods. Yeah. Wow. That was awesome. That was great. That man. was awesome. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Love doing really this with awesome. you, man. Yeah, so. man, Chance, great job, dude. I yeah. love how you're like a little fanboy with the yeah. Yankee stuff. Ooh, whatever you get, like Yankee people on <laughs> you. Are, I love you, man. You're uh, you're my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are the people we've had on. You know, know. we're not getting Ken so Phelps great. on here or like uh, yeah, Andy yeah, Stankiewicz. Yeah. We got no offense to those guys. I love them too. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Come on, star, star, star Stanky. <laughs> yeah, I love Stanky. <laughs> Stanky was actually my favorite back then because I was like built like him, and he was like, it was like if I yeah, were playing right. for you're the like, Yankees. <laughs> yeah, I could play in the big leagues of Stanky. <laughs> You know what I mean? Anyway, Jesus. all right. Well, that's great, man. Right, we James, got more man. coming up. Great job, brother. Man, awesome. And to everybody out there, hopefully you enjoyed that. That was so good to hear Susan Waldman and hear her story. And we just thank you for joining us every week. Keep downloading, subscribing. We see the numbers going. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Push it, push it. Push. Send it to your friends. Yeah. All right, Chinch. Right, Love buddy. you, brother. I'll see Love you next week. See ya. Oh, so great, dude.